Andrea Koppel, host of the Time for Coffee podcast, where you get firsthand career advice into the jobs and industries that interest you the most. And before we start today's show, I have a quick favor to ask you. If you haven't already, I'd be incredibly grateful if you'd give us a rating and a review on iTunes. And if you're like me, you need to do it now because you'll forget later and because it's the best way to help others who may be in search of career advice to find this free resource. So press pause if you haven't done it and do it right now. I'll wait. Thanks so much and enjoy today's show. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of T4C. If you want to learn more about what it's like to work for a mission-driven nonprofit organization in the education field, working on education policy, then this is the episode for you. Because my next guest heads up an advocacy-oriented nonprofit with a mission to improve the quality of public school education in the state of Oregon. But before I introduce you to Toya Fick, the Oregon Executive Director of Stand for Children, I want to make sure you've signed up for the Java Junkies Journal. That's T4C's weekly newsletter, and it comes out on Mondays, and it's got unique insights into dozens of different industries from the professionals who are actually working in them. Just head over to the Time for Coffee website at time, the number four, coffee.org. And the sign up box is right there. Now, my nonprofit Nespresso lovers, please grab your mug and take a chug of your favorite caffeinated beverage because it's time for another caffeinated career conversation. And my guest is Toya Fick, the Oregon Executive Director of Stand for Children, a nonprofit education advocacy organization that's focused on ensuring that all children receive a high quality and relevant education, especially those whose boundless potential is often overlooked and undertapped because of their skin color, their zip code, their first language, gender identity, sexual orientation, or disability status. For more than 20 years, Stand for Children, which has affiliates in nine states, including Oregon, has advocated for better and equal education standards for all children by utilizing a strong three-pillared approach, parents, politics, and policy. Toya's determination to help children succeed is rooted in her own upbringing. She overcame tremendous obstacles growing up in a small town in Louisiana and became the first member of her extended family to graduate from college. Through her experience as a middle school teacher in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and in Washington, D.C., Toya also saw firsthand how bad policies negatively impact the classroom. And she drew from those experiences as an education policy staffer for former Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton, and then as an advocate with the Alliance for Excellence in Education. Before joining Stand in the summer of 2012, Toya worked in government relations for the Oregon Health and Science University. Toya's leadership and her community activism earned her a feature in Portland Business Journal's 40 Under 40 in 2017. She's also served on the boards of the Oregon Food Bank, the City Club of Portland, the Mount Hood Cable Regulatory Commission, and the Citizens Budget Review Committee for Portland Public Schools. Toya, welcome to Time for Coffee. Are you caffeinated and ready to go? I am. I am. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Fantastic. Well, we know that education and advocacy are obviously a super important part of your day, Toya. Absolutely. But let's be real here. What about caffeine? No. <laughs> Where does caffeine rank? I need it. If I don't have it in the first five minutes, we might not have a good day. Okay. So so what did you brew today? I just do Starbucks, the house blend. I am, I'm a coffee person, but I, whatever I can get my hands on is helpful. So you're not picky. Do it at home. 
Okay. Well, fair enough. Cheers. I'm drinking a little bulletproof coffee. I am picky. I've only become pickier (laughs) since I started time for coffee because talking about coffee all the time, you know, you got to like educate yourself on it. But I am a caffeine junkie. Yes. And I live in a very coffee centric city. Portland. Yes, Love you do. I know because when I was working for Mercy Corps, which is mm-hmm. headquartered in Portland, Oregon, I had the pleasure of getting to visit many of those fun coffee shops. Yes, and Stumptown is not far from the Mercy Corps headquarters. As I know you know Stumptown pretty well. I certainly do. Absolutely. Hair of the dog. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I just want to apologize to our listeners that there's yard work and all kinds of stuff going on around me. So if you hear what sounds like, I don't know, a chainsaw or maybe wood chipper, Ah, I think that's what that is because they've been cutting down some trees in the neighborhood. And I think that's the sound that I'm hearing. So I apologize for that. And Toya, there's also a lot of ambient noise on your side. I think just because you're speaking to me over your speaker, your computer speaker. So, you know, as she moves around, nobody can sit still <laughs> for an entire interview. We just want to let folks know that's that's what's going on there. And hopefully you'll be able to stay with us here because we're going to be talking about some important stuff. What about the other traumatic events of 2020, Toya? We've got the brutal murders of Black Americans like George Floyd, Trayvon Martin, Rayshard Brooks, Breonna Taylor and the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. How has that, first of all, how has that affected you as a Black woman and your children? You have a six-year-old and a 10-year-old. Is that right? That's right. Right. We have always talked about race in our home, and now we talk about it quite a bit more. And what I really appreciate is that now I'm seeing their teachers talk about it in a very different way. For example, at the end of the school year, my son's teacher did a unit on Black Your son is the six-year-old. The six-year-old, yes. He was in kindergarten last year. And his teacher, his kindergarten teacher, did a unit on Black Wall Street, which was just blew me away. And I thought, wow, okay, people are really starting to understand the impact that race has had in our country, particularly on Black people. And I hate that this had to happen to get to this place, but I'm glad that people are now more cognizant of it and thinking about it and talking about it a whole lot more than before, because I think that's the only way things will get better is that people recognize that it's a problem and work together to solve it. Have you seen any changes in terms of the advocacy agenda based on new awareness of systemic racism and how that should influence what Stand for Children does in terms of changing policies that affect the education of our children. Absolutely. So we've worked a lot with nonprofits that work with specifically with Black families, and that work has only increased over the last couple of months. Our state recently just passed legislation and funded about $60 million to help Black families and work with Black-led organizations to get through not just what's happening in terms of racism with Black Lives Matter, but COVID has disproportionately impacted Black families throughout the country and and in Oregon. And that's been something that the state has paid more attention to. I'm on the board of a foundation, and we recently also committed $25 over the next five years to Black resilience and to Black-led organizations. And our work On the policy side with education, we've recently worked with Portland Public Schools and Eugene Public Schools, which is not too far from Portland, a very large school district, to help get rid of having police presence in schools because that disproportionately impacts black and brown kids in a negative way. So people are starting to pay attention a lot more to what's happening with black kids in our schools. And it's definitely changed I wouldn't say it's changed. I think it's brought to the forefront more the work that we've done in this space and will continue. Toya, we touched on this in the Espresso Shots interview. And by the way, if you're interested in learning how to break into the field of education policy, check out show notes for this episode to see if Toya's Espresso Shots interview has already dropped. But what has it been like for you? 
as a black woman in the education policy field, which you said in the Espresso Shots interview in and of itself is a pretty white field, let alone the field of education, which often is predominantly white, whether it's white teachers in the classroom or white administrators. Yeah, it's not been the easiest road or the easiest path to take. It's hard in ways that people don't always see. So I live in a very white state in a white city. I think it's Portland's often called the whitest city in America. And I am a black woman. I'm also fairly young, I would say. You're Um, young. I I look young. I'm still carded when I buy wine, which is flattering. It doesn't help in terms of my authority. I, I was to say briefly, I went to a dinner maybe a couple of years ago with some superintendents. And everyone ordered wine. And when the waiter got to me, he goes, can I see your ID? And everyone laughed. That happens to me often. And then I then have to convince people to do what I think we need to do in education. And these are folks who've been teaching or leading school districts longer than I've been alive in many cases. And so, yes, it's been hard. You can't see me, but I usually have my hair in an afro, which is not something you see often in a place like Portland. And so, yeah, I have to wear an extra sort of layer of steadfastness and sturdiness and armor, if you will, to go into the room and command attention and convince people to move in the direction that we think they should be moving with their schools and these resources. Boya, what advice do you have for our young Black listeners, especially, who may be interested in getting into this field? What do you wish you knew when you were in college or when you were just out of school? I would say it took me a while to realize that my experience walking around in the skin, having grown up the way I did, really matters to the conversation. Oftentimes, people who get to make decisions that impact people don't have those same experiences and don't know what could sound like a good idea may not actually work well in practice. Coming from the classroom, I remember that very clearly thinking to myself, the people who wrote these laws that now impact my classroom, my kids, my families that I work with, really aren't folks who understand my kids, my profession, my parents, right? And so that voice in the room really is important and it really matters. And to draw on that, to draw on those experiences as you sort of build your career and move forward is is an important lesson that I, it took me a little while to learn. And I wish I'd known it years ago. Probably known it and owned it, right? Owned it, for sure. For sure. And not felt like because you were different from many of the other faces, looked different with a different background profile than many of the other people in the room, that that meant they knew more than you did. That's right. It took me a long time to realize that I just know different and those different things can be just as important. Or maybe even more important. Maybe even more. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. So as someone who has worked on the advocacy side of a nonprofit, I worked for Mercy Corps for about six years. Mercy Corps is a global humanitarian and development organization, different issues from what you're working on. But I fully appreciate, Toya, how hard the work is and how difficult it is to get ambitious policy or legislative goals across the finish line because What maybe some of our listeners who are not in this world appreciate is that so often you can be working on a single issue for years and years and years for it to come to fruition, if at all. But you and your colleagues have had some big wins. One of them was over the course of 2016 and 2017, when a ballot measure was approved by the Oregon legislature in which every single high school in Oregon is now benefiting from significant new investments in career technical education, dropout prevention strategies, and college level opportunities. How long were you working on Ballot 98, Toya? And what was actually involved in getting it from an idea that you probably mapped out on a piece of paper? to a new initiative that was being implemented in high schools all over Oregon. Oh, man, what a journey. We have been in education policy in Oregon for 25 years now. And before Measure 98, we had never done a ballot measure of our own. So we would help 
local school districts pass their own school bonds, their own local option levies to get more resources into schools, but we've never done one on our own at a statewide level. And so Measure 98 took a lot of guts and courage because it was a new space for us. But we led with a lot of looking at the data. So what we wanted to do was create something that impacts kids of color, particularly in a way that was very clear and very thoughtful. And so we wanted to use the data that was available to us that showed us that when a kid takes a hands-on learning class in high school, their graduation rates are doubled. When a kid is on track at the end of ninth grade, which simply means they have six credits out of 24, they have a fourth of the credits, then they are twice as likely to graduate. When they take a class that is called advanced placement that sort of gets you ready for college, their graduation rates go up to the 90s. It's astounding how clear the data is on those three pieces. And it was also astounding how hard it was to pass legislation just through our regular means of taking a bill down to Salem to our state capital and getting it passed because things are baked in the way they are and we had to convince people that they had to be different and that took a while. So we, we started working on Measure 98 two years before it hit ballot, looking at the data, understanding the research, figuring out how to write the legislation in a way that made sense to voters and then had to convince the Oregon public that it was worth voting for and then convince the legislature in 2017 that it was worth funding because it was a statutory change and the legislature could change it. They saw fit. So it was three years of blood, sweat, and tears. <laughs> there were some tears. And after that session in 2017, the legislature allocated $170 million to the effort. And two years later, allocated $300 million to the work. Wow. So when I would visit high schools before COVID, I'd meet teachers who had jobs because of the work I did on Measure 98. And that I mean, I'm getting goosebumps right now just talking about it and hearing stories of how one educator in a small high school in a rural community helped get the graduating class four times as much money in scholarships than the year before because now there were resources dedicated to helping to support kids in that way because of Measure 98. And it's it's been a journey and it was so worth doing. It was hard, but absolutely changing the game. And I'll just say one quick thing that I'm super proud of. Our graduation rates in Oregon have been in the 70s, and we are still 49th in the country for high school graduation rates. And now we we just cracked 80% last year. And when we talked to districts and when the newspapers called, the first thing they said, superintendent said was, Measure 98 has helped us really tremendously improve our graduation rates. And it's because of that work that we are on a really great upward trajectory. So yeah, it wasn't easy, (laughs) but nothing worth doing is ever really all that easy. I just got chills when you said that. So when you say it's not easy, could you flesh that out a little bit? Because I read that you were touring Oregon. Mm -hmm. So what would a typical day have been like when you were trying to get support for Ballot 98 among lawmakers? Would you basically be camped out in Salem? Would you be yeah. Meeting with lawmakers in their offices, with their staff. What were you doing? All of the above. During a legislative session, they're in Salem in the Capitol every day. I would be there almost every day. That's a big part of what I do is meet with legislators all day long in 15 minute increments, crisscrossing the building to convince them that this is worth doing. Before that, when we were working to get it across to voters, we would go to local chambers of commerce and do a dog and pony show, a little presentation of why Measure 98 is really important. And what I didn't realize, even though we didn't have a funded opponent, so there was no one saying vote no on Measure 98, what we were up against was the fact that people have been doing education a certain way for a while and having, honestly, like having a little black girl come in and say, actually, I think we need to carve out some resources to do it this way because the outcomes are better when we do. I think that was hard for people to hear. It was hard for people to say, yeah, sure, I will listen to this person. (laughs) I will listen to this organization and tell our constituents to vote yes on something that, you know, fairly new. Even though the three concepts were not new, the way we're asking them to be done throughout the state was, and to set aside resources to make that happen had never happened before at the state level. They're usually small grant programs that districts apply for and Only a few of them get it. And we were saying, let's not do that. Let's actually give them the money 
and have them put it into these three buckets. And that was a paradigm shift. And then whenever you're asking people to change their paradigm, it's not an easy road. And that's what we need to do. For those of our listeners who are not so familiar with the way that advocacy works, obviously you see that you're trying to change people's minds. You're trying to persuade them. Toya mentioned at the beginning that one of the things that they did was get data, facts. But Toya, as you were mapping out this campaign with your team, what were some of the other things that you were looking at? Obviously, you had to write talking points. I'm sure you had to draft collateral material, one pagers or something that you would leave with the offices. You probably also had to build a coalition. Maybe that's why you were meeting with the Chamber of Commerce. You right. were looking for local businesses to support the measure. What else were you doing to get this across the finish line? We were looking for stories of people who just happened to be in a school that had career technical education opportunities or students who just happened to be in a school that had advanced placement classes or things of that nature so that we could sort of show that this is not just some idea, some random person's brain, but when it happens, it happens in isolation. And when it does happen to kids, their outcomes are different. So we campaigned just like with a political campaign of someone running for office, there were lots of commercials. So we had to find people, teachers, parents, students who had that kind of story that fit into the narrative we were trying to tell, no matter what your background is, because a lot of people, we've had even legislators say to us, ninth grade is too late. Kids decided to drop out way before ninth grade. And we had to push back against that and say, actually, this student was on a different path. And then got into this class, and now they're going to Florida A and M on a scholarship for aeronautical engineering. So we had to go out and find those folks, which was a big part of our coalition building. Working with, I want to say, seventy different organizations, chambers of commerce, community-based organizations that work with families of different ethnic backgrounds, individual superintendents, school board members. We got the school boards association to agree to support this campaign, even though. Part of the argument against us was it takes away local flexibility. And the school board said, we, we actually need these kinds of parameters to get this done and get this in our schools. So yeah, it took a year or so of building the coalition before we get on the ballot and then going to Salem to make sure the legislature provided resources. And I'm sure you also had a media outreach component too. Oh, maybe yeah. you were doing you or maybe some of your champions were going and briefing the Oregonian mm -hmm. or talking on radio, writing op-eds, all kinds of things, yeah, right? I was everywhere. <laughs> so, yeah, editorial board meetings, a ton of those at uh, this time four years ago, because this is when people really started to pay attention to what might be on the ballot in November. And we were on the ballot November of 2016, which was an interesting time to be on the ballot. And so I spent a lot of time crisscrossing the state, talking to different editorial boards and always bringing local champion with me. So it wasn't just me and our campaign team, but really a local school board person, a local business that said, I have all these jobs available for $40 an hour and can't find the talent because kids aren't coming out of high school or out of community college or whatever with the skills we need to have these very good family wage jobs. And that was, that was our story. Fantastic. Well, congratulations Thank you. on that big win. Your title is executive director. Now, maybe beyond understanding that you're the one who is leading the Oregon chapter of Stand for Children, can you help our young listeners better understand, Toyo, what that means your various responsibilities are in this role? It's sort of a jack of all trades role because you're in charge of all the things that happen for the organization. So that's fundraising. I do a lot of fundraising. I am a lobbyist by trade as well. And a lot of our work is in policy and politics. And so that part of my work is really important. Communications. We have tens of thousands of people on our email list that we've built over the last 20 plus years. We send an email and if people aren't compelled to take the action we need them to take, our work isn't necessarily as amplified as it needs to be. So the communications piece is huge. Staff management, uh, organizers, I have, and we're not a big team. There are nine of us. And so, yeah, managing all the different functions on the team to make sure that we're moving in the 
direction we need to move. And so, yeah, it's a jack of all trades type of role, not even to mention the policy and bill writing. I do a lot of our bill writing. So yeah, it's a lot, (laughs) but it's a great job. And I love what I get to do every day. Can you take us into a typical day? Like right now, we're coming on the beginning of the new school year. What are you thinking about in terms of your priorities? My days start pretty early and our priorities really are about making sure families have the information they need to help their students be successful. And so a lot of the conversations we're having right now are how do we get the information to families? What are we communicating? What tools do we need to give them to be partners with their educators? How are we working with the educators that we train? So we have an arm that I started a couple of years ago that works directly with high school teachers. How are we helping them prepare to be good partners with families? Because that partnership needs to be stronger than it's ever been this year. So if this was regular times, I'd sometimes be on the road to Salem. I'm in Salem quite a bit or meeting with legislators in their home districts and a lot of, again, a lot of fundraising. So it's a lot of meeting individual donors, working with foundations, writing grants, nonprofits need grants to survive. And as I mentioned, I'm on the board of a foundation. And so really understanding that world a little bit better has helped a lot with our work in terms of successfully advocating for things. But yeah, it's atypical right now. So it's a lot of, a lot of phone calls in my office, I've, I've worn a hole in the rug <laughs> while well, I'm at my desk. And I need a new rug. And well, at least you're getting exercise. I am. I am. I'm trying not to do Zoom all day because it's not helpful to just sit or stand in, in one place. Well, before we get into the other roles that you've had in your professional life when things were more normal, <laughs> I thought it would be helpful for our listeners to better understand where your passion for children's education comes from. And I alluded to this a bit in the introduction, but would you mind sharing a little bit more, Toya, about your own childhood and the many obstacles that you had to clear as a young African-American girl growing up in a small town in Louisiana? Yeah, I had some of the best teachers, hands down. I can't think of a year where I didn't feel loved in my classroom. And I'm tearing up as I say this. So my apologies. As you mentioned, I grew up mostly in Louisiana. We happened to move right before I started high school to Charlottesville, Virginia, which also changed my life in ways that I didn't realize at the time and now really fully understand. I, as a kid from third grade, pretty much through middle school was bused to a predominantly white school. So plucked out of my neighborhood driven across town, dumped into a school and was almost always the only black kid in my class for some reason and still had teachers who saw me and understood me and encouraged me. And that was super important. My family is everything to me, but we didn't have the tools. And so doing this work now with families who don't always have the tools, who love their babies and want the best for them, it's really amazing to sort of come full circle in that space. I went to a high school in Virginia that prides itself on being the theater school for the University of Virginia. So I show up with a really, really thick Southern accent and the counselor was very clear that I could go to UVA. If I follow this path, take these classes and do as well as you can, it's our job to get you there. And so many kids who look like me, who have my background, who are on free lunch, who've never set foot on a college campus, don't get that. And now I feel like it's my responsibility to get as many kids that opportunity in Oregon as I possibly can. And that's what I get to do every day. But yeah, school, I just landed in places that really prepared me and then went to college at the University of Chicago. At the same time, a guy named Barack Obama was teaching law school there. And my junior year, I heard him speak about giving back to your community. And I thought, why am I going to medical school? I was pre-med at the time and thought that's probably not the best path for me. I want to go back home and give back to kids who look like me. And that's, that's how I ended up teaching in Baton Rouge and went from there. Wow. That is really cool. I did not know that that is what influenced you to study poli sci. 
it was political side before I took a couple classes before hearing him speak, but really the speech, I remember it very clearly. It was Martin Luther King day, my third year of college. I went with my best friend and we were blown away as people often are after they hear him speak. And this was 2001. And he just talked about, even if you are poor, I was working two jobs in college. Even if you're poor and his family couldn't afford to pay the tuition here, you have something to give back and you need to figure out what that is. And it, you were responsible for that and you owe it to the people who helped you get here. And I just remember having conversations after that about, okay, how did I get here? Because I'm not supposed to be here. Clearly, there's not a whole bunch of kids who look like me here or with my background here. How did that happen? And I thought about my classroom. And I thought about my teachers and really just wanted to be the teacher who gave back to the kids who grew up very much like me and chose to do Teach for America and chose to do it at home. But did you know when you were a senior at the University of Chicago, what you were going to do with your poli sci degree when you graduated? I had no idea. <laughs> I had no idea. I didn't have internships in, in politics or policy or anything like that. I just loved the study of political science. I was a constitutional law concentration and wrote about my senior thesis was on our rights as individuals during times of war. And we were about to go into the Iraq war. So that was that was what I studied and that's what I did in college and also continued to be pre-med and, and worked at an after school program. I did a lot of things and had no idea I'd use the political science part of it, the reading the law, the reading Supreme Court cases and things like that come in handy. People often think I'm a lawyer. I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. I didn't go to law school. I should have. But I've just been reading and studying about this since college. And it really was about how I give back. And I found my way to policy because I worked in a school that was, when I was teaching in Louisiana, that was under the no child left behind regime and had to do all the things that the law said that you had to do to improve. And none of those things worked. And I just remember thinking, whoever wrote this law has no idea what happens in schools. And I, I can't not do something about it. If there's a way to do something about it, I want to figure out what that is. And ended up moving to DC and applying for all kinds of things. And again, got lucky and landed in Hillary Clinton's office because they wanted a teacher who taught in schools that were under no child left behind. And I was like, that's me. I have plenty of ideas. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, first of all, how did you find out about Teach for America while you were at, or maybe it wasn't even while you were still at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And how did you get that job? So I, there were recruiters on campus and I, again, had done this sort of deep thinking about how I landed at a place like Chicago, given my background. And it was my family support and teachers who helped me with the technical aspect and helped me guide the path for me and saw that they were talking about going to teach in mainly low income areas of the country, Louisiana is one of them, and just got to know the program through the presence on campus. There were maybe a dozen kids in my class who ended up applying and getting into Teach for America. It was very rigorous, long interview process, all day interview, lots of essays, all the things. I was super excited when I got in and when I got my choice to go home to teach because I hadn't at that point lived in Louisiana since eighth grade. Wow. I just wanted to go home and <laughs> be near people I understood really well. So yeah, that's how I found out about it. Yeah. And so I know we've been hearing you throughout this interview talk about writing and writing legislation. Did you learn that on the job working for Senator Clinton when I, you were a legislative aide? I did. And I didn't realize that all it takes is writing an outline and then sitting down with the lawyers whose job it is to then find the law and change it. So I spent a lot of time with a group called Legislative Council, and they're the group of lawyers who take your outline and turn it into a bill. And then you read drafts of that bill and go back and forth with them. And I go, I think it needs to say this because this is the idea I have and what I want it to do. And they go, okay, here's how you write that. And so for three years, I would spend, I loved going to Ledge Council. I'd be the the aide who's like, oh, no, I'll take it. I'll go sit there. <laughs> I'll go, I'll go. I want to learn. And most people don't get that experience. And so when I left the Hill, I could write the laws with the relevant statute and just cross out the words that I want to take out and rewrite what I want to put in. And that's what I do now. And that's what I, I get to do for legislators here in Oregon, send them an idea. It's usually 
not fully baked, but pretty much there. And then work with legislative council in Salem to make sure it's right. And there's a lot of back and forth in that process, but I, I love that process. It's fun. And it's not something most people get to sit and do. And I'd have to imagine, Toya, that you also got to learn how to be effective as an advocate because you probably were sitting across the table from others who were trying to influence you when you were working for Senator Clinton. I will say, though, that I was there from 05 until 08. And we would work a lot with people from the other side of the aisle. We'd sit in rooms for hours a day hammering out the reauthorization of No Tell Up Behind or the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act or whatever bill we were working on. And we did it together a lot. And so I learned from all the people in that room because everyone had different perspective and different experiences coming into that room. Many of them had worked for the Department of Education or on Capitol Hill for a long time. And I just would absorb how they got their ideas across and what they were advocating for and sort of use that to help me be more effective. Again, I was a fish out of water in that room because I had never done this work. Yeah. I think you cannot discount how much you learn through osmosis Mm -hmm. and the opportunity just being in a room to take in the way those who've got more experience than you do, do their thing. Exactly. But for our young listeners, especially our young Black listeners, Toya, who may still be in school right now, who are saying, wow, like what recommendations do you have for them? They're still in college right now in terms of either classes, skills they should be trying to cultivate through coursework and then also extracurriculars? Are there certain types of experiences that they should try to have volunteering? What kind of volunteering or internships? What kind of internships? Maybe they can't afford to come to Capitol Hill. Maybe they live in another state. What do you think would really help set them up for a career in this field? So a couple of things, even if they can't get to DC, which is not an easy place to get to. I mean, I could not imagine going straight from Louisiana to an internship in DC, but your local legislators are local, right? They have local offices. They are always eager to get more help and support for the work that they do locally. So there are local house representatives and local senators. Even if you can't go to DC, sometimes you can work for the person in their home district. Same thing with the legislature in your state. These are very, sometimes those jobs have high turnover, right? So looking for opportunities there would be helpful too. But I, this might shock people that I actually just thought about this. Student government is so fascinating. and It's an amazing experience because your job really is to sort of take ideas from your classmates, from your colleagues, and feed them up to an administration who may or may not think those ideas are great and convince that administration to do something very different. One of my colleagues was the first black president of her college class. And she'd learned a ton just sitting in the room with the provost and the dean of students and the president of her university advocating for X, Y, or Z. And it has come in handy as she organizes and works with families and other organizations across the Portland metro area. So that's, I hadn't thought about that. I love student government and how it sort of gives you the skills public speaking skills, listening to constituents, and then sort of taking that idea and feeding up the chain, if you will. So that's something I I always now encourage folks to get into if they're in school. Yeah. What about classes? You've mentioned in our Espresso Shots interview, or maybe it was in this interview, about the data piece. Mm -hmm. Is it important to maybe try to take a data science class Mm -hmm. or something in the hard sciences that would be useful. I took a lot of science classes and that helped really shape my understanding of data. I went to Chicago where there's a huge public policy school. A a master's in public policy is one of the options you can do there after graduating if you get in, of course, but there are a lot of public policy classes at the undergraduate level that were a crossover with my political science degree. And those were super helpful, just population data and what's happening with a group of people. 
and how you know a policy is effective in one way, shape or form. That was super informative. And I wish I'd taken more public policy classes in college for sure. Excellent. Okay. Two final questions, Toya. I try to ask all of my guests if they would share a time in their professional life when they struggled. It certainly sounds like you've had one amazing experience after another, but as someone who has a few more miles on her odometer than you do, I now know that we all have ups and downs. And I want our young listeners to know that they may too have really tough times. And that doesn't mean when they face plant that somehow or another, they're never going to be able to succeed again. (laughs) No, it's just part of the process. It's part of what happens. Sometimes we have a coronavirus that affects all of us at the same time, but more often we are going through private struggles. So what was your experience, a time when you may have hit a roadblock or face planted and how did you persevere, Toya? And was there a lesson that you may have learned in the process? Yeah, that's a great question. Believe it or not, I almost quit working for the senator because I felt like a complete fish out of water. It was not, as I said before, not a space I was accustomed to navigating. Office politics was not my thing. Politics in general, I'd never really worked in politics. That was a very different thing. And it's it's one thing to write a term paper or write a thesis and get an A. It's another thing to write talking points under pressure and get an A on that, right? And so just feeling like I didn't really have much to contribute, feeling like I didn't know what I was doing. And that was that was really hard for someone who has thought, oh, if I just work really hard, it'll all work out. And really sort of understanding how to do the work, not just doing the work, right? So one thing I learned in that process was I just remember thinking about the spaces that no one really owned. I felt like I needed to own something and be good at it to be good at this job. And when you work for someone like Hillary Clinton, everyone's coming your way to ask her to help solve problems. And I just continued to raise my hand on things that I would bring a unique perspective on. So for example, I remember having a conversation with colleagues and someone was trying to figure out like what to do about this food stamp issue that was coming down from New York from constituents. And I go, oh, I've been on food stamps. I, I may know something about that, right? And just trying to carve out a space where I felt that I could be successful translated to the work that I had to do in education and in housing and other spaces that I was resp- helping to be responsible for in terms of the senator's agenda. So yeah, just finding little victories was important, especially when it feels like you don't know what you're doing in the, in the big picture and the grand scheme of things and really just sticking with it. I was going to quit within the first year and holy cow, like how different would my life have been if I hadn't stayed and figured it out? And then using resources of folks who are there to help you. I mean, I, I have some incredible mentors from that time in my life because I just asked for help. I was struggling and I needed help and I was not afraid to ask because we all, we all get there. We all have those times and uh, just really working through that with people who love and trust me was really important. How did you find the courage to ask for help? Well, it was either ask for help or maybe screw up so bad that they asked me to leave, right? So it was just like, okay, what's what's worse, being fired or asking for help? I'm just going to go ask. And people like being helpful, which I didn't know. I thought people just didn't like to be bothered. And so taking someone out to coffee who worked in a different office, who was, from my view, successful at what they do, which was similar to what I was supposed to be doing, was one way to just say, hey, how did you navigate this? How did you learn how to do that? And people tend to be generous with their time and sharing what they know. And so, yeah, just sometimes when you don't have a choice, that's the choice you have to make, right? I had to work and pay bills. And so being fired was not an option. So it was either figure it out or be in a lot of trouble. (laughs) Yeah. Well, you clearly have much more courage than I did when I was your age because I was too insecure to admit I didn't know what I was doing. And I was afraid that if I had taken somebody out for coffee, which didn't even occur to me, Toya, to say, hey, do you have any advice for me that they would laugh at me or 
then, you know, the big reveal Mm -hmm. that that I was green would somehow become an open. Yeah. Open secret. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And the truth was, it was an open secret. Of course, everybody knew I was green. Of course, they knew all those things. But I felt more like you had to fake it till you make it. Right. And I thought that for a while, too. But I, I think I was so bad in the first year or so that it, there was no faking it. It was, <laughs> it was clear to some of my colleagues that I was not, I had no idea what I was doing. And so, yeah, the choices were asked for help or be asked to leave. And I had to figure it out. Well, power yeah. to you. Thank oh, you. my gosh. Final question. If you could go back to college, back to the University of Chicago and do it all over again, but based on the wisdom you have now, what advice would you give yourself? I would say one thing I wish I had done in college was take the economics classes that were available at a place like the University of Chicago. I was terrified of how good the university is in that space. And so just decided to avoid it altogether. That's crazy. I could have learned so much. So take that class. Don't be afraid, even if you have to audit it the first time and just sit in there and absorb all the things and then take it for real the next quarter, do it. And the other thing I would say to maybe 19 year Toya is that if you think you're busy now, <laughs> wait 20 years, you're not that busy. Take a class, go see the play, volunteer, do more because The more experiences you have, the more you have to draw from later on in life. And I just thought, you know, I work two jobs and political science and pre-med. I'm pretty busy. I can't do any more. That's that's not true. So, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Do more. Toya, I want to thank you so much for making time for coffee today with me and the T4C community. You are such a remarkable woman and leader and Stand for Children Oregon is so fortunate to have you at the helm. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much for listening to this latest episode of T4C. And if you're interested in learning more about my coaching services for confused college students and recent grads, feel free to check out the Time for Coffee website under the coaching tab at time, the number four, coffee.org or text me at 202-236-5712. That's 202-236-5712. Thank you.